coming up on Show 873, series production of the Volkswagen ID4 begins. Stick around, I'll tell you more. Plus, Chinese EV maker Neo launches battery leasing. The iPace gets cheaper. Well, a cheaper model, actually, but only in Germany. And why the British Army are going electric. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you're listening in the world. Welcome to EV News Daily, the edition for Friday, 21st of August. It's Martin Lee here, and I go through every EV story so you don't have to. Uh, thank you, as always, to the sponsors of the show, myev.com. You'll see if you watch the YouTube version of the show. Well, it's only the audio, don't get excited. Uh, but you'll see their logo. MyEV is a marketplace in the US, all about connecting buyers and sellers uh, with each other and teaching you about the pros of driving electric, because electric vehicles as they say, are better. Well, from Volkswagen's press release that I received today, and I quote, Volkswagen's electric offensive continues to gather speed. Series production of the brand's first all-electric SUV, the ID4, gets underway in Zwickau. Uh, the world premiere of the ID4 will follow at the end of September. Preparations to roll out the electric SUV at international level are in full swing. Pre-production of the ID4 has started at the Anting plant in China. China. Uh, the Chattanooga site will start the ID4 production uh, the year after next in 2022. The SUV will initially be launched with rear wheel drive, with electric all wheel drive versions added at a later date, but they don't say what that later date is, but it's okay for me because personally I think uh, the longer range rear wheel drive or even front wheel drive versions of EVs, well for me, you know, I don't live in a climate that needs all wheel drive, so selfishly I, I take range over the practicality of all wheel drive any day. Well, Push EVs points out that the Volkswagen ID4, the one at least made in Europe anyway, is using the new NCM712 battery cells. They're made by LG Chem. They're made in Poland. Uh, later on, the made in the USA version will get its battery cells from SK Innovation, and the made in China version will probably get their battery cells from CATL. Made with very energy dense batteries, but also very affordable batteries. The NCM712 chemistry brings the cost down below 100 euros per kilowatt hour and the rather expensive Volkswagen ID3 and the ID4 will be profitable cars, says Push EVs. Extremely profitable, they say. On average, more than 15,000 euros for everyone they sell. That's why Volkswagen only wants to sell their cheaper electric cars. So the Volkswagen Group, like the E-Up, the Me, the Go, uh, because that's on the old platform. And they only really want to sell those tiny city cars if they can't reach their emissions targets. Uh, this year, because of COVID, all car sales are down although EV sales are up, but combustion sales have been dropping like a rock. And it's good news in a way if you're looking for a silver lining because the fewer petrol cars that these big car makers sell means they haven't got to sell as many EVs. Now, they don't have the EVs to sell and they don't really have the the cars on offer at the moment. So they haven't got to sell as many EVs as previously expected at the beginning of the year. Uh, that means that they will sell more of the very profitable ID3 and the ID4 cars and not the small little city cars that they don't really want to sell you. Uh, that'll be enough. The ID3 and the ID4 between it, it'll be enough to comply with EU emissions regulations and VW doesn't sell, uh, need to sell the little triplets, as Pushy V says. Well, Tesla has started rolling out a new suspension update with real-time visualization on the screen inside the car of the suspension and what it's doing. Uh, this is for the Model S and the Model X, the cars equipped with the new fully adaptive damping suspension, says Fred at Electric. Model S and Model X vehicles have long been equipped with standard smart air suspension, but when Tesla launched the new Raven editions, as they're known as, the updated vehicles had new adaptive suspension. Well, Tesla said, and I quote, you can now see a real-time visualization of how the suspension system is dynamically adjusting each wheel's damping to account for changing road conditions. If you tap show suspension data, you can get even more real-time information. Adaptive suspension damping now has an advanced setting that allows you to set custom levels of ride comfort and handling, in addition to the pre-set existing comfort, auto and sport settings. We've simplified the Tesla suspension control logic to better support both, uh, support both uh, temporary and more permanent heights. If ride heights 
are manually adjusted to high or very high, you can now your car will automatically lower after you start driving. But for snowy and off-road conditions, you can tap the keep button and it'll keep that very high road height. Uh, for steep driveways or places where you need a higher ride height, tap always raise at this location. And it'll use the GPS data to always raise the car when you get to your driveway with a, an awkward bump or a slope or something. Uh, this feature will raise the suspension to a saved height when you enter that GPS location. Not something that is new to cars, by the way. Adaptive air suspension has been around a long time and some of this GPS tracking stuff has been around for a while as well. I think with this story, actually what's new is the fact that Tesla will show you a visual representation of the car on the screen uh, with some overlays, some traces of what the suspension is doing in real time. And that's kind of cool. The rest of it, well, the other car makers have been doing it for a very long time. But actually, they've taken it a step further for the data nerds. Now, for many people, Tesla are appealing because they keep things simple. They don't overcomplicate things. Uh, but just like track mode, just like being able to get real deep into the settings on track mode and, and start tweaking, they're increasingly giving those that want access, all right, I'll say it, the nerds, the geeks, people like me, uh, they're giving them access to those features, they're giving them more data, but equally, for those that really don't care, the Tesla interface still does remain a, a very simple user interface. Big story coming out of China today. Uh, the Chinese EV maker Neo has launched a battery leasing service that allows drivers to buy the car without ever owning the battery pack, one of the most expensive components in an EV, thereby lowering the entry price of getting into the car, says Reuters. The service has been nicknamed Battery as a Service. Now, you've heard of, well, you may have heard of things like Software as a Service, SaaS, right? You may have heard about, which is just subscribing to something. Uh, you may have heard about uh, other things. Well, increasingly, hardware is being just provided as a service, so you're just renting it, really. And, and the same for batteries. They've called it battery as a service, B-A-A-S, bass. However, it's just battery rental. I've been doing it for years on my Renault Zoe. But they've given it a new name. It's battery as a service, and it means you pay monthly for your batteries. The cheapest Neo car is the ES6. That's a sport utility vehicle. So the ES6 is the SUV. It costs about forty thousand dollars equivalent without the battery pack. It's about ten grand more if you want to buy the car with a battery pack. Of course, these are all. You know, it's in China. It's not in the US, but I'll do it in dollars. Well, NEO already has 143 battery swapping stations around China. Drivers can swap their empty battery packs for a fully charged replacement. It takes five, six, seven minutes or so. It is pretty slick operation, little as you can imagine. The, uh, the car, well, actually, I don't know if you have imagined it, but the car lifts up. So you drive the car into the bay, and then the car is lifted I would say maybe a metre off the floor, possibly. Then a sled comes out from the side, takes your battery out from underneath, disappears off for a few minutes, and then it comes back and has a new battery, and it goes underneath your car. So that's already very common with Neo. Now, a lot of people can't get their head around leasing or renting the battery pack, but it's already... And I get that, right? I get the people buy a car and can't get their head around not owning a huge chunk of it. But I would say, I don't have an issue with my Renault Zoe, by the way, because it took £8,000 off the entry price of the car. Otherwise, we'd have had to go you know, hardcore finance. And so we were priced out of that car until £8,000 was taken off it because Renault still owned the battery. It's the biggest bit of the car to go wrong, and it's their problem if it does go wrong. And also, they offer things like free recovery. So if the car breaks down, or even if I don't charge it, and I run out because I just forgot to charge it, on the motorway, it's free recovery. So it works for me with Renault. I think with Neo in China it works because, well, it works because they're already in the right mindset in terms of the battery not being part of your car. So even if up until now you've bought the battery with the car, Neo owners, unlike when Tesla tried it in the US, it's a, maybe it's a cultural thing. Neo owners don't have a problem. In fact, they like the idea of going to a battery swap station a few minutes, you walk, you drive away, and your car is full again. So the pack underneath your car, you know, has been recently checked because they do. They take the, the packs out and they check all the cells are good. Any that are showing signs of they might not be, they take them out of service. Of course, over time, battery pack 
sizes are increasing. And so all Neo cars, in fact, they're sister cars as well, they're cousin cars from a BAIC, they have the same battery pack dimensions. And so as cells become more efficient, actually, you fit more energy. So what was a 60 kilowatt hour becomes a 70, 80, 90, 100 kilowatt hour battery pack in the same space. And so over time, your battery pack in your Neo gets bigger. And again, that's a benefit. As well, many people in China don't live in houses with off-road parking and control over their electricity. Just many are living in multi, either multi-occupancy dwellings or just high-rise buildings where if you're lucky, you can charge, uh, park your car rather nearby, but certainly no chance to charge. And actually, people wouldn't have bought those Neo cars without battery swapping because for them, it's like opportunity charging. So they're going to go out and they're going to get some groceries. They're going to go out and get some supplies. Uh, they're going to go out and get a few essentials. They're going to go out and get their battery swapped. It becomes part of that, what's one of the chores that you've got to do in life, like going to get a pint of milk. So that's super interesting how the cultural differences mean that in China it's working for Neo, and now they're introducing battery leasing because, again, it takes 10 grand off the price of the car and it means that more people can get those cars because they didn't feel like they ever really owned the battery anyway. New company's been set up, by the way, to manage this and lease the batteries out, which will be a revenue stream for them. Well, Jaguar is working on an entry-level iPACE, but it's only for Europe, and at the moment, moment only looks like it's going to be for Germany. Looks to be a limited edition module, uh, mod, model. <laughs> That's the word. My brain slowed down to a, a crawl there. A, a limited edition model, which is strange because normally limited edition models are more powerful and special and cost more money. But this is a limited edition model that is less powerful and costs less than the full fat model. It's called the EV320S. E, and that refers to the metric horsepower, according to stuff.co.nz. Uh, 100 kilometers an hour, that's uh, 0 to 62 in 6.4 seconds, unlike 4.8 seconds for the existing I-Pace. Goes a little bit slower top speed as well, but the range is the same, and a few optional extra extras get thrown onto this car, so it's slower, but you do get 20-inch wheels, you get the electric opening boot, heated mirrors, LED headlights, 14-way adjustable seats, etc., etc. UK isn't getting this model, uh, but it is in Germany. I think Norway as well. So it's slower, it's cheaper, it's got more stuff loaded onto it. We'll see if that's attractive for potential iPACE buyers. The British Army is trialling EVs for their military vehicles. Hybrid technology is being tested by the Army in two of its armoured vehicles to improve both sustainability and enhance their stealth capabilities, says the Daily Mail newspaper. Uh, the hybrid electric drive system developed by the Coventry-based company NP Aerospace, along with uh, General Dynamics and Supercat and MagTech, means that uh, they are delivering, they say, multiple technical and operational enhancements to the British Army, introducing hybrid technology batteries to their vehicles, which will reduce as well the Army's reliance on fossil fuels, they say. I'll pop a link to the article if you'd like to read more about this story. Well, here in the UK, Hyundai is helping a leading theme park and zoo uh, my UK listeners will have heard of Chessington World of Adventures. And post-COVID, they're getting back on track. And Hyundai has provided the electric cars for the resort's brand new Safari Adventure, says Motor One. In a first for a UK attraction, the guests are going to be driven around by a park ranger. The park ranger will be driving a full electric Hyundai Kona. And of course, when you're travelling through the Safari, you're going to be inside the enclosure. So you'll be metres away from zebras, giraffes and the other animals in the enclosure. Of course, it means that we aren't spewing out fumes so that humans can gawp at animals, uh, but it also means that they're not going to be disturbed and spooked. And so that's a fantastic use of electric vehicles, uh, an edge use case, I would say, but one which I've never considered. Well, Lyft, the ride-sharing company that featured on this podcast only a couple of weeks ago, has joined up with the EV100 scheme by announcing their commitment to reaching 100% electric vehicles for their ride-sharing and ride-hailing uh, platform by 2030. But you would know that if you listen to the Saturday special on this podcast a couple of weeks ago. Check it out in the archive. It's still there. It's a Saturday special interview, and you can hear for yourself their plans to be all electric with all of their drivers and all of their cars by 
2030. Uh, says Smart Transport website, the company is estimating that making the switch to save uh, to go to electric will save drivers on the platform $10 billion in reduced operating expenses. And EV100 is an initiative by the international non-profit organization, uh, which is called the Climate Group, bringing together 70 over 70 companies committed to accelerating the transition to electric vehicles and making EV transport the new normal by the year 2030, alongside companies like Lime, AstraZeneca and IKEA. Well, moving on, and Renault. Through their subsidiary company, Renault Samsung Motors, uh, which operates in South Korea, have just put the Renault Zoe, as you know, the car I drive, on sale in South Korea. According to Inside EVs, after deducting subsidies of about ten grand, ten thousand dollars in Korea, the effective prices are between twenty-eight and thirty-two million won. It's about twenty-four thousand dollars equivalent to about twenty-seven thousand dollars equivalent for a car that has a fifty kilowatt hour, well, fifty-two kilowatt hour battery. And you know what? The the the, the new Renault Zoe is like a little mini Tesla. It's got the big screen. It's over-the-air updates, big enough battery for a small, what is a small, I wouldn't say a small city car because we do plenty of long runs on the motorway in it, uh, but it's that size of car. And, you know, Renault definitely wants to sell a few thousand of them every year in South Korea to be a big export market out of Europe. Well, sales of electric vehicles in Australia have tripled in 2019, despite a lack of government support, according to the industry's body. Uh, The country's network of EV charging stations has been growing in Australia. The Electric Vehicle Council's annual report found that, including a rise in the number of DC fast charging stations, uh, the cars have been increasing as well, but still from a very, 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 very low base in Australia, says The Guardian. Uh, There are now 28 electric models on sale. Eight of them are below $65,000 Aussie dollars. Six more are arriving before the end of next year. Uh, Two of them are going to be cheaper models as well. Uh, The Morrison government in Australia uh, promised a a national electric vehicle strategy would be finalised by the middle of this year, which has come and gone. That policy has been delayed. The Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, last year accused Labour of wanting to end the weekend and forcing people out of their four-wheel drives and into electric vehicles. Hmm. Uh, Not too many of my Australian listeners ever email me with positive things to say about their administration. Uh, In fact, I think I can say 100% of Aussies that have emailed me that I have my listeners down under uh, don't agree with policy in Australia and would like to see things changed. Look, me too. Like, you guys have so much solar. Like, you know, you could be driving on sunshine so easily. In fact, maybe not this time of year because I was chatting to a buddy in Melbourne and it was raining at nine degrees the other day and he had his beanie hat on and it was, was cold, but either way, and the fire was on. But either way, many parts of... Oz are so hot and you've got the sun, you've got the climate to have loads of solar generation and you're driving around on sunshine. It would just be so cool to have more EVs in Australia. But, you know, fingers crossed and good luck there. Something very, very, I think this is clever. Final story today on the podcast. Now, I've been following the journey of the chairman of the board of management of Volkswagen Group, Herbert Dies. He has been blogging on the LinkedIn platform, and he took his summer holidays this year, and he drove down to Lake Garda, a place that we've been to, very, very beautiful, and we met plenty of Austrians and Germans, actually. When we were in Lake Garda, uh, we realised that's kind of a big destination uh, for the Germans and Austrians. Uh, we had a lovely time there. Hi- highly recommend it. Hired a car. We're there for about a week. Fantastic. Uh, hired electric bikes as well. It was brilliant. However, the boss of VW has been blogging his way around his holidays because he drove an ID3 on holiday and has been posting pictures of his road trip and blogging. And I'm surprised it hasn't had more press, certainly within the EV community, because it's very open and it's it's great. Now, look, this is from Google Translate on the latest article. So, you know, bear with me. Uh, Google Translate says uh, that Herbert wrote, uh, we've had a great time with the ID3 on the way to Italy. The vacation trips with modern electric cars are working really well. The cars offer much comfort and drive confidently that the the vacation can begin with great serenity 
even with vacation tripping. Uh, the charging infrastructure between Munich and Lake Garda was well developed. Only the charging stations will have to be displayed more precisely on our navigation systems in the future. There's currently a discrepancy of around 200 metres with some of them. Many people saw the vehicle for the first time during my trip. I was really pleased with the reactions. Uh, the curious and interested looks show the ID3 is cool. Uh, so he's on message, but he is criticising their software, saying, look, you know, sometimes we don't put the chargers in the right place and we need to fix that. But also, can you imagine being one of the VW ID3 engineers when you're just about to ship the car to customers, you think you're there and you're starting to relax. And then the big boss of the company says, oh, I'll take one on my summer holidays and I'll blog on LinkedIn about it. Yeah, that is squeaky bum time. But by the look of it, it went all right, and they got away with it. And so he seems pretty happy uh, with the car. And I just it's clever. I just think VW are getting, you know, because that does more good, I think, anyway, with those people that... And it's got thousands and thousands of reactions on LinkedIn and comments and et cetera. Th that does more good than running a flashy TV ad campaign uh, with incredibly, you know, achingly cool hip youngsters staring out of a, a window in some, you know, anonymous city that could be anywhere around the world as a car drives past at dawn and the person looks at it and the, they think, hmm, hmm, electric. Like, like, all this car advertising is so crud around EVs at times. Actually, VW have got it here. Whoever persuaded him to do it, if it was his idea, great. If it was a PR person uh, saying, look, can you blog about your holidays? Fantastic. It's worked really well, uh, and it makes them human. It makes him more human. It makes VW uh, more human. And uh, I'll pop a link in the show notes if you would like to read more about the post that he entitled Mein Erlab mit dem ID3. <laughs> All right, that's your show for today. Hope you enjoyed it. Get in contact via email, hello at evnewsdaily.com or leave a comment on the YouTube show. Thank you to my uh, supporters on Patreon. Couldn't do it without you, and I appreciate everyone who signs up. And on a Friday, I'd like to give you a bit of love in return. So premium partners, Phil Roberts of Electric Future, Brad Crosby, Avid Technology, Porsche of The Village in Cincinnati, Audi Cars of Cincinnati East, Volvo Cars of Cincinnati East, NationalCarCharging.com and AlohaCharge.com, and Derek Riley from the EV Review Ireland YouTube channel. Hello to my partners of the show, David and Lisa. They like to listen to the podcast together, David and Lisa Allen. OEM Audio of New Zealand and evpower.co.nz. Gareth Hamer. E-Mobility Norway. Uh, check him out at emobilitynorway.com. And also Bob. Now, Bob Boothby runs Millbrook Cottages and Elopement Wedding Venue. And also Darren. Hello, Darren McCleskey. All partners of the show, and I appreciate it so much. And a quick mention for all of the exec producers. I know it's a long list. Bear with me. I like to do it because I'm so grateful. Alan Robson, Alan Shedd, Alex Banahini, Alexander Frank, Anders Hove, Andrea Jefferson, Asir Khalid, Ashley Hill, Beard Fuchstack, Brent Kingsford, Brian Thompson, Bruce Bahan, Charles Hall, Chris Hopkins, Colin Hennessy, and Cam ZV, Craig Coles, Greg Rogers, Damian Davis, Darren Fetch, Dave Dewson, David Finch, David Moore, David Partington, David Prescott, and Don McAllister. Happy anniversary, Don. Uh, celebrating... Uh, 15 years, I think, I saw on Twitter earlier this week of ScreencastsOnline.com. If you have a Mac product and would like to know how to use it, ScreencastsOnline.com. Eru Kyunyin Yombi, uh, Frederick Rovic, Gene Rubin, Gilberto Rosado, Jeff Lowe, Headley Wright, Ian Griffiths, Ian Sear, Ian Watty Watkins, Jack Oakley, James Storr, Jim Morris, John C. Sola, John, who is Beardy McBeardface at Ken TV's, John Manchak, Juan Gonzalez, Ken Morris, Kevin Masson, Carl Mayan, uh, Carl Mayan, Lars Dallager, Lawrence D. Allen, Lee Brown, Luke Cully, Marcel Ward, Mark Bossett, Marty Young, Matt Piscioni, Mia Oppelstrop, Mike Winter, Nathan Gore Brown, Neely Roberts, and Sussex EVs, Nigel Miles, Ohan Aston, Paul Ridings, Paul Stevens, and Pete Glass, Pete Gordon, Peter and Dean Roberts at Oxen EVs, Phil Mouche, uh, Philip Troutman, Raj Badwell, Rajiv Narayan, Rene Kimmick, Rene Schneider, Richard Lupinski, Rob Hermans, Rob from the RS Thinks EV channel. He's on YouTube. Uh, Rupert Mitchell, Seiki Payne, Stephen Penn, Steve John, Thomas J. Tias, Todd Oaks, The Plug Seeker, and his EV YouTube channel, Tim Gutteridge and William Langhorn. Have a great weekend. No Saturday special this weekend. Uh, returns in a couple of weeks' time with a new interview. I will see you Monday for a brand new week of news. Have a wonderful weekend. And do remember, there is no such thing as a self-charging hybrid.